Uh, hello everyone, I'm Janet patterson Kane. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Morris Animal Foundation and I'd like to welcome you to our third Golden Zoomies call uh, where we talk about some of the scientific research uh, using the data and samples from our hero dogs and other important scientific issues affecting the study. Uh, so before we introduce our scientists for today, I'd just like to get the team behind the scenes uh, to introduce themselves. So Amy and Emily, perhaps introduce yourselves and if you've got any instructions for any of the participants. Good morning, Hi. everyone. Oh, oh, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Emily and I am the Girls Operations Coordinator. Um, so I work with the um, the study team a lot. I'm possibly someone you've talked to on the phone, um, just work to kind of keep operations moving. And we actually do have a lovely housekeeping slide we can share that has some instructions um, uh, that we can go over once Amy's also introduced. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. I'm the executive assistant for scientific programs here. Um, so I'll be running the slides today and helping Emily um, monitor the Q&A as well. Yep, um, just super quick to go over the Q&A slide, or the, excuse me, the housekeeping slide. Um, basically, we will have Q&A discussions um, after talks or at the end of the webinar as time permits. Um, if you want your question submitted, use specifically the Q&A button at the very bottom. There's a chat and a Q&A. The Q&A is where you'll submit your questions to be answered. Um, if you have any tech issues, comments, or anything like that, the chat function is where you can put it. It'll come to me and Amy, and we can handle that. Um, and then there's an option for closed captioning at the bottom to turn on live transcripts if you would like those. And if you want to disable it, you can click um, the same button and click hide subtitles and let us know if you have any questions. Excellent, thank you. So now we're going to get our three scientists to introduce themselves. Uh, so first off, Tom, perhaps uh, tell us a bit about yourself and what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, so my name is Tom Roseberry. Uh, I'm the VP of Engineering and Computational Biology at Loyal. Um, we are uh, a dog longevity company working on treatments to extend the lifespan and health span of dogs. And we were also interested in developing diagnostics to help um, people take action uh, when something is going wrong with their dogs. Excellent. And Jeff? Hi, I'm Jeff Wood. I'm a pathologist at the University of Guelph, the Ontario Veterinary College there, and I'm interested in early diagnosis of, of cancer in dogs and also in other things about cancer in dogs, but mostly through um, these golden retriever samples. We're able to sort of look back in time at blood and, and try to find uh, markers that might detect cancer early on. Excellent. And finally, Julia. Hey everyone, I'm Julia Labadee. I'm the epidemiologist for the Lifetime Study, um, and I also am a small animal veterinarian on the side. Excellent. So as you can see, we have a scientist from industry, we have a scientist from academia, and we have a scientist who works for the Morris Animal Foundation itself. So we should have a, a good <coughs> mix of scientific activity here today. Uh, so first up, Tom's going to give you a little presentation. Again, if you'd like to ask any questions as we go, uh, go into that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Okay, thank you, Tom. Hey, great. Thanks so much for that. And so today I'm going to talk about a uh, diagnostic that we are developing using something called DNA methylation to detect cancer uh, in the golden retrievers. Um, so next slide. So we're all kind of familiar, at least with what DNA is. Um, it's basically the blueprint that the body uses to uh, produce proteins that actually are the building blocks for your entire body. Um, and so there are different ways that cells can actually um, allow parts of DNA or genes to uh, actually be activated or turned on or off. And one of these things is attaching something called a methylation molecule, which you can see here is DNA. Um, if you're somewhat more, uh, more savvy to the cellular biology, there's, uh, the DNA is wrapped into a chromosome. Sometimes there are other molecules called histones um, that the DNA wraps around. But these little methylation molecules are uh, tiny little bits that get attached to the DNA and will actually turn off genes. Um, and this is a way that the body um, can actually regulate which proteins are actually being produced. 
Um, in some cases, this can actually happen uh, in uh, aberrantly or in a bad way, and that can actually uh, lead to cancer or indicate the cancer is, is happening uh, in the body. Um, where have we seen this before? If you go to the next slide. Um, this using DNA methylation has been started to be investigated for actually humans. Um, and so uh, what this large paragraph is actually saying is that the evidence is uh, promising that we can actually detect cancer in humans, uh, taking a blood sample and using uh, uh, measuring the amount of DNA methylation or the fraction of cells, percentage of cells that actually have uh, a particular part of the DNA methylated. Um, it's promising, but we don't have these prospective study cohorts. So we don't have these longitudinal cohorts um, of, of study participants to actually detect the early onset of, of cancer. Um, and so what happens in these studies is usually they just take a, um, a group of people that have developed cancer and a people of group that or a group of people that have not developed cancer and compare them. There's no, well, where were these people before, uh, before this in time and where did the people develop cancer um, who are in the cancer group? Those uh, data sets don't really, uh, don't exist to have, be able to do that with. And so that's actually one of the coolest parts about the, the girls uh, study in the data set is that this has been collected prospectively. Um, this has been collected prior to the onset of cancer. So we can look for those signatures um, in the DNA methylation, where those uh, methylation molecules have attached themselves to the DNA, uh, to see where this is uh, where this is happening, or to, uh, to possibly detect the early onset. So, if we go to the next slide, so this has actually been somewhat done before in the same way that it's been done in humans, where there's a group of dogs that has uh, not detect or not developed cancer compared to a group of dogs that has developed cancer. Um, and they measured methylation at about uh, 27,000 DNA locations and just on the genes. Um, and 26 locations out of the 27,000 were different between cancer and controls. Um, so what we're wondering right now is can we detect this, this cancer earlier? And so um, what our study looks like, if you go to the next slide, we got eight, um, we received eight golden retriever samples, uh, longitudinal samples, so taken over a period of time. Um, that had developed hemangiosarcoma sarcoma, and eight uh, goldens that had developed B-cell lymphoma. And then um, we also received eight mass controls. So trying to control for age that they entered the study, uh, sex, uh, castration status, uh, even if we could location. Um, so trying to keep things uh, as equal as possible. And then what we're trying to do is um, look back in time and measure the methylation on the DNA at uh, various points in time to see if there's a difference between the two and where that difference develops prior to the onset of the cancer. And so we actually, this was a, a long process to get our first samples done. Our uh, company that was doing, this is actually uh, genetic sequencing is actually kind of the, the way that you measure this. And that sequencing company actually had a lot of problems with uh, supply chain. And so it took uh, about twice as long to get the data back as we expected. However, we just got it back uh, on Sunday. And so we just started to dig into it. Um, and our bioinformatics scientist has already found, if you go to the next slide, um, in our case, instead of measuring just 27,000 locations, we measured 4 million DNA locations. And we found over 2,000 locations that are diff different between cancer and controls. And so what you can see here in this graph is that each one of these bars is the percent of cells that had methylation at this specific site that we were measuring. We now have 2000, over 2000 of these graphs that look, um, look different between our, our control dogs and our cancer developed dogs. Um, you can see that in certain cases like that, that one red bar uh, further to the right, uh, a cancer dog does not look exactly uh, like the other cancer dogs. Um, but because we'll be measuring in so many different locations, um, we can actually take what you could think of as an average um, uh, to make these predictions from and have a much, uh, much tighter or uh, more accurate prediction. And so it's looking really, really promising um, that, that we can actually do this. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to actually be able to share data with you. I didn't think that I was gonna be able to do that. <laughs> um, so in the next steps, if we go to the next slide, um, we will be building algorithms. Um, so that, that was just uh, what I just showed you there was just comparing uh, the last sample right collected right before the dog developed cancer and then the, uh, the control sample that was matched to that. 
we now have all of these samples that uh, occurred before that or were collected before that. So we want to figure out what those um, what those graphs look like as we walk ourselves back in time and develop those algorithms to detect those differences earlier. Um, and then uh, at that point, we want to validate these findings um, by uh, getting obtaining more samples and sequencing them as well, or uh, testing them as well, and then uh, making sure that our algorithms are actually working. So that's where we're at. Fantastic. We don't have any questions from the audience yet, but I just wanted to maybe put some to you myself. Actually, firstly, just to um, mention what Tom had alluded to there, COVID has really <coughs> slowed things down in terms of supply chain. So we've been talking about genotyping our dogs, so our work has been held back too by that. That's just the way science is, is happening at the moment. Um, so looking at what you're talking about there, Tom, where we're so where you were saying there were previous studies where dogs or humans with cancer are compared with dogs or humans without cancer, but they'd already been diagnosed, right? Mm, so, right. so with our study, we've, we've sampled those dogs for every year. So we have a lot of samples that were taken before that diagnosis of cancer. I'm just going to put you on the spot here. How far before the diagnosis of cancer do you think we'll start to see this kind of signal? Or do you not really have an idea yet? Like, could it be three years beforehand we might be able to get an idea? I honestly have no idea how far we'll really go back. Um, I mean, there is, there is a possibility that the seeding for uh, certain types of cancer might have happened very early on in development. And you just have this um, uh, a latent signature that uh, is predictive all the way back to one year old or something like that. I. I, that is the least likely possibility, <laughs> but that would be a very cool possibility because then you could actually um, bring it in for, uh, bring your dog in for testing and catch it a lot sooner. Um, I, I would definitely bet that we could um, see something a year in advance, um, but it, yeah, the prediction that gets uh, lower and lower probability is you get earlier and earlier. Yeah, so this hasn't really even been done in people yet. No, nope, it has not. Okay, so fantastic. Yeah. The, our hero dogs are really at the forefront of the science. Uh, we do have a question here from one of the audience. Uh, it's about hemangiosarcoma, actually. Um, <laughs> and, you know, most of the time it's a very sudden diagnosis. Like suddenly the dog bleeds into the abdomen or has cardiac issues. So we don't really know, though, how suddenly that cancer really does arrive. Um, so given that cancer seems to hit so fast, do you still think we might find something much earlier on to indicate that cancer's on its way? I mean, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> I think it's definitely possible that there will be some uh, some signature there. I, this is where I think a year in advance is possible. Um, but it's, it's absolutely right that the mangiosarcoma comes on so fast that it could be just a quick mutation um, that switches on. But that mutation has to come from somewhere. So there definitely is a possibility that we see it in the methylation data. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping so as well. Um, there's a question here that I think is quite interesting. Um, someone whose dog, a hero dog, was diagnosed with a lymphoma in the subcutis. Um, and, you know, most of the lymphomas we look at are in the lymph nodes or internal organs. Do you think this sort of approach will work for something that's in the skin? Do you think that it'll detect anything? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the blood is circulating everywhere and it is, um, there is a lot of, I mean, it doesn't come in physical contact with the skin, but there's a lot of diffusion that, that happens. Um, it's a, it's definitely a possibility um, of all the places to collect. It would, I mean, other than collecting from the skin itself uh, at the site, um, the blood would be the best chance of it uh, as opposed to say saliva or feces or something like that. Um, so this this would be the best chance to, to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, with all the skin cancers we see, that, that would mm. definitely be interesting. Another question here, do you think that the methylation patterns that you're talking about would be similar for different types of cancers completely? I mean, would you end up kind of not knowing uh, what cancer is starting to develop? Yeah, what they found in the human literature, there are commonalities. Um, there are certain methylation sites that are... Um, that have that are the same uh, between cancers and then certain sites that are completely different. So that's how actually kind of these signatures are developed is that they there are um, there are these common common portions and then there's the differences. And that's 
actually kind of how the diagnoses are being developed in humans is that, um, and trying to uh, say which type of cancer the human is developing is from the commonality combined with the, <clears throat> with the unique, uh, unique signatures. Okay, one final question before we move to the next talk. I guess, you know, often when we're thinking about early detection of cancer, the question kind of is, well, if something shows up, what do you do? Uh, I mean, do you have any plans for if something like this shows up, how would you kind of find where this cancer is developing? Yeah, at that point, you would definitely want to take it, take your dog into the vet for uh, a dog or to, to get a checkup at least. Um, cancer uh, treatments in dogs are actually uh, developing quite rapidly at this point. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that uh, in that area. And so what we don't want to do is develop the treatment for the cancer and then not have a diagnostic. And so we're for us, we're focusing mainly on the diagnostic because we, we know that in parallel with this, treatments are on the way. So we want them you know, to both be developed in parallel. Yeah, I know that's a good point. The collaboration between diagnostic scientists and people involved in therapy, uh, and that's definitely essential. Thank you very much, Tom. We may come back to you later on with more questions. Now we're going to move Great. on to uh, Jeff's talk. Hi, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so I'm Jeff Wood, I'm gonna to talk to you, it's very similar to what Tom was talking about, but um, some, some different kinds of molecules in blood. So microRNA for early diagnosis of cancer in dogs. The next slide. So you're very familiar with this study and um, as Tom sort of outlined, you know, we are interested in looking back in time a little bit because these samples, the blood samples are collected every year and banked, uh, we can then look back and see, could we have detected this cancer before the diagnosis happened? And uh, you'll see that little, this is the sort of up-to-date primary endpoints um, where the common cancer is being diagnosed uh, here, hemangiosarcoma, which we just heard about, um, lymphoma, um, which I'll talk about today, and um, also osteosarcoma, which isn't as common in golden retrievers, but I will also talk about that a little bit as well. Okay, next slide. So you've just uh, had the nice introduction uh, by Tom about what DNA uh, is and the methylation part of it, and I'll take it sort of a, a slightly different further step. Uh, DNA is made in, into messenger RNA and then into protein, and protein's that part that um, is actually um, the business end that actually does things. And there was this, this is supposed to be animated where the microRNA goes up. I don't know if you click on that, if it'll do that. It looks like it's not animating for you guys. Nope, go back. Okay, so um, the microRNA actually is made from DNA as well, and it, and it binds to messenger RNA, and it stops the translation of, of uh, that message into protein. So that's what it does, but that's not what we're uh, using it for actually. Okay, the next slide. So how do they get into blood? They're these little tiny um, RNA molecules um, and they are made by tumor cells and by normal cells. And in tumor cells, they have abnormal levels, some of them do, of microRNA and they have abnormal transport of the microRNA out of the cells and into blood. So we can stick a syringe in there and you can take some blood and then uh, measure those microRNA. So the good thing about them is they're incredibly stable in serum. They, they don't um, degrade like most other things in serum, especially if they're frozen, they can last for many years. Uh, and in humans, we already know that there are some changes, uh, specific microRNAs that are associated with certain cancers. And there's hundreds of different types of microRNA that have uh, functions and regulating genes. Okay, next slide. So what do we do in the lab with these? Well, as you know, these golden retrievers have their blood taken every year, they're put into this uh, frozen archive. And then we would look back and say, we're interested in dogs and lymphoma. We would get a sample out from before the diagnosis. And then we would go through these various machines here and. Um, that is how we measure the microRNA. So we measure hundreds of microRNAs in every uh, sample, um, and, and then we can try to correlate that um, with, with outcome or with um, disease forming. Um, so this is sort of just the machinery. I thought I'd show you a picture of my lab. It's on the next slide. And there he is with his white hair, looking very handsome, and the dog isn't bad looking either. Okay, next slide. Oh, 
that is not how it shows up on mine. Okay. Are, are you guys using a Mac or something? Anyway. You know what? I put it in PDF. Let me. Oh. Um, sorry. Let me pull it up it's, a different way. Hold on just one second. Oh, yes. Much better this way. Okay, yeah. So we started looking, um, and, and as Tom mentioned, you know, you start out looking at diagnosis because that's the time point that we have. And we have a tumor bank at the Ontario Veterinary College that, that I helped to run. And so we were able to look at these samples at diagnosis, compare them um, to normal dogs, and also compare them um, for different levels of microRNA we found. Um, and how well the dogs do after therapy. So this is two examples of on the left is lymphoma. So lymph node cancer on the right is osteosarcoma bone cancer. And in these dogs, it just happens, this is already uh, published that uh, microRNA, and they're just numbered, 31P is one of the numbers. So uh, 31 dogs with, with low uh, 31P live a lot longer after lymphoma treatment than dogs with high um, MIR 31P. And similarly for osteosarcoma, uh, MIR 214, dogs with low levels have, have a lot longer survival after surgery and chemotherapy than, than dogs with high, <clears throat> high levels. And, um, you know, this, this has also been found by another group as well. So it is uh, fairly well confirmed. And this may help us in terms of uh, prognosticating. So once a dog has cancer, you know, how well are they going to do after therapy? Should you go through all the surgery and chemotherapy and everything else? Um, do they have a higher likelihood of doing well, surviving longer? Okay, next slide. Yeah, so the interesting thing about some of these is that uh, this, these microRNA is that there's more than just one that can help predict outcome. And some of them are high predicting good outcome and some of them are, are low predicting good outcome. So it's not always high microRNA that um, correlate with bad outcome. So the other thing that's different is that, or interesting maybe is that we took samples from microRNA from the actual tumor itself uh, with a fine needle aspirate from lymphomas and from the blood and they are different microRNAs. So what's made in the tumor cell isn't always released into blood. And um, what's high in a, in a tumor cell as being bad may not be uh, show up in blood and vice versa. So they're different and that's kind of interesting. And this is already published. The next slide. Um, and for bone cancer, osteosarcoma, again, we're finding differences between the tumor and the, and the blood and the microRNAs themselves, like the numbers here are different than what you find in the lymphoma. So that brings, that's sort of, addresses that question that was asked, could you discriminate between different types of cancer developing and you might be able to. And again, there's multiple microRNAs, some are raised, some are lowered uh, in tumors versus normal. Okay, next slide. So hot off the press, we had a couple extra days from Tom Thursday night, this, this data really got you know into the format it's in now. So these are golden retriever lifetime study dog samples. Um, these are, limb, these are dogs that got lymphoma. And these are all pre-diagnosis samples, except for one of them that's at that zero line um, that was at diagnosis. The rest are, are basically the year before they got cancer and the year before that. So um, if you click, it should show some little lines. Yeah, so basically um, that pink section there is these are, these are dogs that developed lymphoma and the dogs in the normal dogs there are, are dogs that, that did not develop lymphoma that are from the golden retriever lifetime study. So we know they had, you know, at least a couple of years where they did not have cancer and we've got the blood from them. So there's a bunch of dogs there that are in that pink box that are over, um, they have um, levels of this particular microRNA that are, are much different than, than normal dogs. And that goes out, you know, well over a year for some of them and others, you can see those, the pink and blue line that are dropping down. That's that, that microRNA is changing uh, over time and moving them into this region where you might flag that dog and say, Hey, this, you're at potential risk of developing lymphoma. And the other one, if you click again, the microRNA B here, that's even better actually, because there's almost no overlap 
between those dogs in the pink um, box and the normal dogs. There's just a few of those normal dogs that have slightly raised microRNA B, um, but many of those do not. Now you'll notice also that there's some dogs that are um, in on the right panel, that, that blue line, that dog does not have um, abnormally high microRNA B, but it would have been picked up already in microRNA A, right? So we're looking probably at a signature that happens, right? Uh, where multiple mirrors uh, microRNAs might, might help predict. You wouldn't just rely on a single one. Um, yeah, so the only dog that doesn't get picked up in this is that purple one in the middle who looks pretty normal. And, um, you know, perhaps that's a dog, we'd have to look into the um, clinical records, you know, maybe that dog, you know, was diagnosed with lymphoma, but maybe survived very well with it. It may not be a particularly bad one. We don't know. But that's certainly going back in time. And the other thing that I think is interesting is that, you know, some of these dogs with, with this high mirror B, um, it's high, you know, way back a couple of years before. And that's something that just came up in Tom's talk. How early can we go? And is this something that's made by the tumor? Or is it something that tells you this dog is predisposed to getting lymphoma? It's not coming from a tumor that started two years ago, um, although it's possible. Uh, it's more likely that that's a risk factor that we're picking up. Yeah. Okay, next slide. So interestingly, um, this was just published last year. This is uh, one of the rare human studies where there was a bunch of blood donors and they had banked the blood and uh, some of these blood donors ended up with lymphoma later on. And you can sort of see, this is a different scale. I don't like how they've reported this, but they're doing fold change, which is not we report it. And there's these spikes in microRNA um, 326 going up before those uh, humans were diagnosed with lymphoma, uh, looking back at their blood. But that is a really hard study to do. And interestingly, uh, mirror 326 is exactly one of those two mirrors that we found as well. So very similar between human and dog. And you can see some of these increases are coming up, um, you know, before a year, uh, a year before diagnosis or so. So still, you know, pretty early, really. All right, next slide. So what are we doing? We're just finishing up these lymphoma studies. We also, those are all B cell lymphomas and we're also doing T cell. And we find a bunch of other mirrors that are different in the T cell one. So you may even be able to tell that it's going to be a certain subtype of cancer. We wanna confirm these results, right? This is only eight dogs. We wanna confirm that in an independent group of um, golden retriever dogs from the same study that developed lymphoma because there's lots of them. There's like 85 dogs or 58 dogs, can't remember. Um, you know, and try to do this in osteosarcoma as well, because we have a lot of data on osteosarcoma um, from other breeds mostly, but we can go back and look at these few uh, golden retrievers that developed it, see if we could have detected that early. And on Tuesday, my Morris Animal Grant goes in to try and pay to do this, uh, these studies. And the last thing I'll leave you with is hemangiosarcoma. If you go to the next slide, we've done this in dogs, um, again, from our our group, our tumor bank itself. And we found and already published this as a, as a poster that we can, um, you know, there's differences in, in different microRNAs, again, different from lymphoma, different from osteosarcoma, uh, where dogs with hemangiosarcoma um, look like they have altered microRNA at the time of diagnosis. So we'd love to go and look back in time, um, again, with the golden retriever samples for uh, hemangiosarcoma as well. And the, the nice thing about hemangiosarcoma, um, and this sort of came up in the last discussion is, you know, if you find that early, we don't know how quickly it develops, but um, especially if it's in spleen, you can just take that spleen out, right? You don't have to necessarily do chemo or go hunting for um, a tumor. There's certain locations that are pretty common. Um, and that, that would be a great potential preventative uh, measure for hemangiosarcoma. Okay, next slide. These are just some people who worked on this, especially Latasha, who's the student on this project. There's lots, the point here is that there's lots of different people involved, pathologists, cancer biology people, bioinformatics people, um, and the clinicians at our own institute. And of course, uh, the funding here has all come from Pet Trust. Um, and hopefully we'll get some more animal funding in this grant we're putting in next week. Um, and certainly the samples you know, come from our own tumor bank and also from you guys. So um, put on the next slide. I rarely get to thank, at the end of all my talks, I thank the owners and their dogs for these samples, but I don't actually, they're not usually there. So you're here. So thank you and your golden dogs. Um, 
for uh, uh, submitting these samples. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks for that, Jeff. Um, got a, one question here. I'll just start off with one of my own. Um, you know, you're talking here about looking at many, many microRNAs at a time. And certainly previously in diagnostic science, we used to try and find one thing, you know, one thing that'll show us uh, if someone's going to get cancer or give us a diagnosis. Could you just go into that a bit further, the strength of looking at all of these things? I mean, how many microRNAs are you looking at at a time? Yeah, so uh, we look at 277, which is not all of them. And the, the thing that's interesting, I didn't really mention about that, but sort of implied it, is that they're very similar across species. So some of these sequences that um, the actual like 22 letters that make up the, the uh, microRNA are 100% are identical across human, cat, dog, cow. Um, and some are slightly different and some are very different, but most of them are quite homologous across species. So that's kind of good. So we actually use, we order microRNA uh, arrays um, from a company. Um, we tell them we're doing dog studies and they make it up and give it to you. And if you look and look at the, the actual codes they use, it's from human or cow or something else. That's just where they develop the probe. So they're very similar across species. So we measure 277 and then we cut down to just the ones that we're interested in, which is about 60. And some of those are not, I mean, I didn't show the ones that aren't different, but there's some that don't change at all. Um, between uh, dogs with cancer and dogs that are that don't get cancer, um, so there's you know there's certainly it's not like every microRNA changes, um, but there is a risk I think if you do too many of overfitting, where you say well if I took these twenty microRNA I can predict every dog that's going to get cancer of these ten, but that may not apply to the to the whole situation. So having more samples is always better, uh, so you can really see the breadth of uh, what microRNAs change. Yeah. So, you know, we think we can probably do it uh, with 60 or so. Amazing. Yeah. And like I said previously in diagnostics, we're just looking at one thing. So this yeah. is definitely the way the field is going. Uh, so one of our audience um, had a, a older golden retriever that died of pancreatic cancer and had spread to the liver before diagnosis. Um, they were just wondering if you are doing any studies on solid tumors, those, those other sort of tumor types. Yeah, so so not with with these goldens. There's not enough of them that got pancreatic cancer to to look at that. Um, but um, osteosarcoma certainly is solid. It metastasizes quite early uh, in the disease, um, so that would be sort of similar. Um, the other things we are doing is sequencing um, tumors, a variety of different tumors in dogs with a group in the UK, um, and pancreatic is one of them. We're trying to do with dogs and cats. Um, and we did do a study a few years ago on pancreatic. The most common mutation in humans is, is KRAS, and dogs don't seem to have a lot of KRAS mutations, but they are getting a different, uh, more commonly getting a different subtype of pancreatic cancer than humans, um, just where it develops in the gland, the duct versus the asinus at the end. They're different in the, in the human and dog. So slightly different, but um, you know, the idea would be, um, as with the pancreatic cancer, if you detect that before it's metastasized, it's way easier to treat. You can potentially do that with surgery alone, maybe some chemo, but you're not looking at trying to um, you know, kill tumor cells that have spread all over the body. That's really hard to do. Yeah, and that just brings up a point for the hero owners out there. We do have to wait to get sufficient numbers of cases of cancers before we start working on them with scientific projects. So we're definitely there with hemangiosarcoma, as you can imagine. <clears throat> we definitely have quite a few cases of lymphoma as well, but other cancers, we only have a handful of cases or maybe one or two. Um, so just one last question. I'm going to put you on the spot as well, but it was great to see um, the data there from our dogs and kind of tantalizing to see uh, how far before that diagnosis we're seeing changes. Do you think it's worth going even further back? It looks like some of those were different, um, you know, a couple yeah. of years beforehand. Yeah, they're out in you know, 600 days and they're quite, you know, they don't, they're stable too. They've changed or they're different and they're, they're staying like that right up to diagnosis. And, um, you know, 
I would, I would wonder about, so there's a study just last month or so on lymphoma in cattle of all things. And in cattle, it's caused, caused by a virus mostly, um, bovine leukemia virus. And the thing there is that they can, they can know that these cattle are infected with the virus long before they actually get the lymphoma. And they followed them along. And somebody went and looked at microRNA. And wouldn't you know it, you know, 326 comes up in their um, blood before microRNA 326 comes up before they get their lymphoma. So it's really amazing that it could happen across the three different species. And, and some of those uh, bovine leukemia cases, you know, or leukemia virus causing lymphoma take quite a few years to develop the actual lymphoma. So um, you know, there may be a virus that we don't know about that's working here, it'd be unusual, but it's possible, or whatever other predisposing factors are there are, are happening really early um, in those dogs, and, and that means they need close monitoring to, to make sure they get detected early. Fantastic. Yeah, so again, for those of you who've got dogs in the study, trying to find uh, ways of, you know, detecting cancer extremely early is one of the things we're really hoping for. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Uh, good luck with the grant application. Thank you. All the best for that. Uh, and then we'll move on to Julia, who is a scientist who works within our foundation. All right, um, so now that we've heard all about all the cool research that's being done with our samples, I sort of wanted to zoom out just to talk about how we diagnose cancer in the study um, and what that means for our study participants. Um, as we all know, cancer is one of the primary outcomes of this study, and we're all very passionate about helping to decrease the amount of cancer that golden retrievers get. Um, but that doesn't take away from how hard it is to hear those words when it's about your own dog. Um, cancer diagnoses are often very devastating, um, and it can kind of put you in a haze where it's really hard to make decisions about what to do. I know that I've experienced that myself, even as a vet. Um, so I do think that just sort of having some background knowledge about how cancer is diagnosed um, and what sort of tests you can do can help when you're in those situations. So that's my goal today is just to talk to you about those options, um, both from the perspective of the study and then also uh, from your perspective as an owner. Um, so next slide. So as of June 1st, we are pretty close to the halfway point of reaching our 500 primary endpoints. Uh, right now, we're seeing a big increase in the number of dogs that are getting hemangiosarcoma. So that's our most common cancer. Um, with lymphoma slash leukemia sort of following pretty closely behind. We fortunately haven't seen quite as many high-grade mast cell tumors or osteosarcomas as we initially predicted. But these numbers represent sort of both confirmed and suspected cancer diagnoses. So they're ignoring how um, confident we are in the diagnosis. And when we're doing studies like the ones that we just talked about, they really need to know that the dogs for sure have cancer to, to work on those diagnostic tests. So from a research standpoint, we wanted to devise what I call um, tiers of confidence for our cancer diagnoses. So next slide. So I'll go into this in more detail in a little bit, but basically um, tier one is a definitive diagnosis. So that's a dog that we would use for the studies that we talked about today. Um, these are cases that are microscopically confirmed using either um, histology or cytology. Tiers two and three are in the presumptive diagnosis category. So for a tier two, that might be a dog that, for example, had an MRI that showed some sort of spinal cord tumor, but they were unable to get a sample of it to know what type. Um, a lot of tumors in dogs have sort of characteristic locations or appearances, so we can be pretty confident in, in a lot of these tier two diagnoses. Um, tier three would be ba based sort of just on a vet's best clinical judgment. So um, the simplest explanation would be like an older golden retriever that has enlarged lymph nodes and doesn't have another obvious reason for that, like horrible dental disease. So we can be pretty confident that that's lymphoma, um, especially if the dog continues to do worse as time goes on. I just want to take a minute here to say that um, no matter what tier your dog is in, it's incredibly valued to our study. So we use all of the information from all the dogs in the study um, and everything is helpful in reaching our goals. So I don't want anyone to feel like if their dog is at tier one, that they're not valued. They definitely are. And we will still use them um, in all of these kind of, all of the work. It's just that they wouldn't necessarily go for one of these diagnostic tests. Okay, next slide. 
So if we break down our current tiers of confidence um, for the primary endpoints that we have, we can see that actually most of them are tier one diagnoses. Um, hemangiosarcoma is a disease that's more likely to have a tier two diagnosis. And I think that's just related to how suddenly these dogs get sick, which we kind of alluded to earlier. They're often really acutely ill. Um, and so it may be harder to make decisions to make sure that we get the samples for a tier one diagnosis. So I wanted to just kind of go through um, each of our four primary cancers and give you a bit of background on how we diagnose them. Um, of course, every case is going to be different. Um, so this doesn't take place of your, your own veterinarian's recommendations. They're gonna know the most about your dog's individual case um, and what's going on there. So this is just sort of meant as an overview. Um, next slide. So I'm going to use my own dog as an example. So this is Maggie. Um, you'll also see her in my background. She's also at my feet. Um, she is about 12 years old now, so I'm constantly uh, worried about her getting cancer. So this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so next slide. So I just wanted to kind of start off with some basic terminology of cytology and histology. So cytology is what happens when your vet takes um, a needle aspirate of the tumor. Some people call this a needle biopsy or a fine needle aspirate. So they take the needle and they sort of poke it into the tumor and then they kind of squirt the cells out on a slide and they look at it under the microscope. Um, the pros of this are that it's relatively minimally invasive. You usually can just do it at a regular visit. You don't need any sedation. Um, it's less expensive as well. Um, the possible cons here are that you can't always get a definitive diagnosis. So certain tumor types are really great with this diagnostic type. Other ones um, don't exfoliate well, which means basically you poke it with a needle and you don't get anything back. And so it doesn't help you with the diagnosis. Um, the con here from the study's perspective is that we don't have a banked tumor sample then that we can use for future studies. Um, so that's just a consideration. Um, for histology, um, this is what happens when you take your dog in for a biopsy. So these can either be um, a full surgical procedure where they're under anesthesia and the whole the whole tumor is getting resected, or it can be something that's just under sedation where we do like a punch biopsy for some sort of skin tumor. Um, pros here are that we usually get a definitive diagnosis. And if it's a little unclear, there's a lot of additional staining that can be done to help get us a better picture. Um, we also would have a big tumor sample available for future studies in that case. Um, but the cons, of course, are that these are more invasive and costly. Um, for the study, we do have reimbursement money available for biopsies. So that helps. Something else I just want to mention is for cytology, you can either have um, what I call in-house or send out. So in-house is when your vet just stains it in the back and looks at it under a microscope and makes an assessment based on that. Um, many vets are really good at this and can be pretty confident in their diagnoses. Um, send out means that it actually is shipped to a diagnostic lab where a board certified pathologist will read it and make a diagnosis. So we need that for our tier one diagnoses because we just, these these pathologists are very well trained and so we can trust their, their, um, their diagnosis a little more because we know exactly what kind of knowledge they're bringing to the table. Okay, so next slide. So to start with osteosarcoma, um, these dogs typically present with some degree of lameness, um, but it can be anything from a really mild lameness that's been going on for a couple of months to a dog that's just outside going potty and suddenly fractures its leg. Um, so this is disease that we really need some sort of imaging to even get into the tier three category, because obviously we can't see bones um, with our naked eye, or hopefully we can't. If we do, we have a really bad problem. Um, so osteosarcoma has a very characteristic appearance on radiographs or x-rays. Um, so that might have a very high suspicion just based on doing that um, in their clinic. So the distinction here between tiers two and three would be if the vet um, submitted those radiographs to be reviewed by a board certified radiologist, that would get us into the tier two category. And of course, we could also have more advanced imaging like a CT as well. Um, for a tier one diagnosis, we'd need a sample of that tumor, so either a biopsy, or you can actually sometimes get a fine needle aspirate of the bone and send that out as well. Um, next slide. 
So technically, our primary endpoint is actually high-grade mast cell tumors. So in order to call a tumor high-grade, we actually need the biopsy because the grading is based on um, the specific appearance of that biopsy. Um, most owners ultimately pursue surgical removal of mast cell tumors. So the majority that we have are tier one and based on a biopsy. Um, but you can actually diagnose these um, generally based on a, a fine needle aspirate um, because they do have a pretty character characteristic appearance. Um, so that could be used for a definitive diagnosis if it's sent out or for a tier two diagnosis if it's, if it's read um, in the clinic or in-house. We just wouldn't know the actual grade in those cases. Um, dermal mast cell tumors can have a pretty characteristic appearance, um, although it can be kind of controversial depending on who you ask. Uh, but if the vet is highly suspicious based on how it looks, uh, we would put that as a tier three diagnosis. Um, next slide. So that brings me to lymphoma leukemia, which is um, the disease that I've spent most of my career studying. So lymphoma is actually a pretty heterogeneous disease and can present in many different ways. Um, so for simplicity, I'm just gonna talk about the most common presentation, which is enlarged lymph nodes. Um, if we see enlarged lymph nodes, like I said earlier, in a middle-aged to older golden retriever, we're often pretty suspicious of lymphoma because it's common in goldens. Um, so many vets might just make a tier three diagnosis based on that. Um, especially if an owner doesn't want to pursue further diagnostics. Generally, fine needle aspirates are enough to make a definitive diagnosis of lymphoma because it does look, again, characteristic under the microscope. Um, so we would get that um, in-house tier two or a send out would be tier one. Um, we can also do a biopsy of a lymph node that's affected. Um, so that would work for a tier one. And there's also some special tests that can be done for lymphoma that include um, flow cytometry or PAR. And those are really nice because they can help us determine the actual subtype as well with the biopsy because we can do additional statings to determine the subtype. Um, so next slide. So lymphocytes are most simply split into either B or T cell, but there's a lot more nuances than that. Um, but this can give you really important information about the prognosis of the actual tumor type. Um, lymphoma prognosis can range from anything from about two weeks to well over two years, depending on what type. So it's really helpful to have this additional information. Um, and also from a research standpoint, it's very likely that each of these different subtypes have different risk factors for developing those diseases. And so it's really nice for us to have this information so that we can look at risk factors for specific types of lymphoma. Okay, and the next slide. So that brings me to um, hemangiosarcoma, which in my opinion, is the worst type of cancer. Um, these are dogs who rapidly go from normal, happy, wagging their tails um, to being very, very sick. Um, this is usually an emergency, so it's very stressful. You're trying to figure out if your dog's gonna be okay. And so the study is often the last thing on people's mind at this point. And often they may even be at an ER, so they're not with their regular study vet, which can make logistics confusing. Um, so, Imaging of mangiosarcoma can be characteristic because it typically occurs either in the heart or the tumor or spleen. Um, and these dogs often present bleeding from their tumors. Um, we can do cytology in an emergency situation and just know that it's bleeding, um, which gives us useful information, but that doesn't often tell us the actual tumor type. Um, and unfortunately, this disease has a very poor prognosis, so a lot of people don't have the time or ability to move forward with diagnostic because it's just not in the best interest of their pet. Um, sometimes we do actually manage to catch these dogs early enough that they're stable and we can do either an ultrasound guided um, tumor sampling if it's a splenic tumor or um, do surgery and remove the whole spleen and send that in. Um, but other times the dogs just aren't stable enough for that kind of work. So that brings us to um, a discussion about necropsies. Um, it's always really helpful to the study when we can get necropsies because we can get um, biopsy samples and definitive diagnoses. But of course, this is a very personal decision. So we would never require a necropsy, but we're very appreciative when owners are willing to do this. And many owners feel like it's nice because it does bring closure by providing a definitive diagnosis. Um, next sl slide. Um, another thing I just want to mention that's really helpful for some of the studies like the ones that were talked about today is if we can get clinical pathology samples um, near the time of diagnosis. So um, 
that would be getting the blood and urine samples when they're diagnosed. Um, obviously, this is up to you and your vet about whether your dog is feeling well enough to, to undergo these diagnostics. Um, if they're feeling really sick, we don't want to put them through that. But it can be really helpful um, for like Dr. Wood's study, um, because then we know exactly how they looked at the day they were diagnosed and can compare that to a year or two prior as well. Um, next slide. And that's it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Julia. I always like seeing those photos of your own dog with the, <laughs> the gray muzzle. Um, I've got a question here. We might need Emily for this as well. Um, so it's around the reimbursement. Um, so basically, um, how much are the hero owners reimbursed if they want to have a biopsy taken? And if they've already used money for the biopsy, do they still get something towards the necropsy if they opt for that? Yeah, um, so how it works is that there is essentially a pool of $500 um, for the time that your dog is in our study. And um, that can be used for any biopsies or necropsy, um, anything like that. But just how it works as an example, if you have a biopsy and we reimburse you for $200, you'll then have um, $300 to use towards any future biopsies or a necropsy. So there's a little bit of... Um, you know, judgment of, of when and how you want to use it. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. And I would say we do have um, some funding from the V Foundation to use tumor tissue. Uh, so we will be using it. And so the more necropsies that are done, the more biopsies that are taken, it'll be better for the study. Okay, Julia, I've been saving a question for you, uh, and it's on the topic of uh, hysteresidic sarcoma. So we have an owner in the UK whose golden retriever was diagnosed in February. Uh, it was a tumour in the spleen, as is pretty typical, uh, was removed, and he had eight rounds of chemo, still doing well. I was just saying, um, I can find very little about this type of cancer, and do you have any information? Could you perhaps start off by talking about what we've found in the study with hysteresidic sarcoma? Yeah, definitely. Um, so histiocytic sarcoma is not a very common tumor. I always associate it more with Bernese mountain dogs, um, but we have actually seen, um, we have about 26 cases last I checked, which is much more than we expected um, for this study. I think a big reason for this is that a lot of these dogs um, do present sick and sort of present similar to hemangiosarcoma. And so often I think you know, outside the study, these dogs are euthanized, but because we've had necropsies on so many, we've actually been able to diagnose histiocytic sarcoma, where I think otherwise it might not have been. So that's been something that we really didn't expect from the study that we're hoping to look into um, more, but I'm really glad to hear that your dog is doing so well with the chemo. Yeah, and so basically we've made this an end point of the study now, so we would anticipate being able to do some research with those histiocytic sarcoma samples. Um, okay, a couple more questions for you, Julia, um, and I think this is a very typical story. My dog was fine in the morning walk, but did not stand when I came home at lunch. I rushed uh, to the vet who said, too far gone, and she was euthanized in less than 12 hours, but at least I was with her. Is this normal? Unfortunately, very normal for hemangiosarcoma. It's really common to sort of present uh, really quickly and with dogs that are very sick. Often it's because these tumors are very vascular and so they start bleeding or rupture and then your dog, you know, their abdomen will fill with blood or if it's a heart tumor, their the sac around their heart fills with blood, which makes it really hard for their heart to beat. Um, so they, they can get really sick really quickly. And so we're really hoping that with this study, we can find earlier diagnostic tests so that we can hopefully catch these dogs when they're at a treatable stage as a to when they're really sick. Yeah, and as I think we've seen in the work presented today, just because something presents very quickly clinically doesn't mean it hasn't been going on for some time beforehand or that we wouldn't be able to develop tests for that. So we're very hopeful for that because that's a really traumatic thing to have happen. So I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, okay, another question. Um, my hero died of a very rare cancer. And this is, oh, this is also a question human uh, medical research as well. Will the study be able to use any of her data? 
I think definitely, and I think especially given the research that was presented here where there are some signatures that are just tumor signatures. And so I could see that sample being useful to like Dr. Roseberry's study where they're just trying to figure out if we can detect cancer period earlier so that those samples would definitely be useful. We might not have enough of that cancer to look at risk factors specific for that tumor, but we can definitely look at it as a general tumor risk factor. Yeah, and I would say we do get scientists contacting us who are just making up numbers. So they'll take some dogs from our study, but they'll have some dogs from other sources. And so we're just contributing to that study with some of our data. Okay, I think we're coming up to time now. Uh, so I'd very much like to thank our speakers for today. Uh, Tom, Jeff and Julia, thank you very much for, for giving us your time. Really like to thank everyone who showed up today. Please let others uh, the hero owners know that we've done this talk, we'll be making this available on YouTube, uh, particularly the usefulness of the samples so we can give those samples to scientists like Jeff and Tom. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, wish everyone a happy holiday season from the team at the Morris Animal Foundation. Thank you very much. <laughs>